brothers do you recall when the grasslands reach to the horizon? And the deafening roar of countless wings overhead. Back when Rome was a village at Britain, the Emerald Island. Before we gave up on our future and buried our dead. So I guess everyone is here, so we can pretty much start. So I want to finish what we didn't manage to finish last time, which is not an awful lot of stuff. And then when we're going to jump on, we still on shamanism, but we're going to jump on to um, more the concepts of death, afterlife, and souls in archaic religions. Can everybody hear me all right? All right. And yes. If, and if somebody wants to say something, like wave at me or something, so that I can stop and let you speak. If somebody has a question or comment, okay? Should we just raise our hands like we did in school, maybe? <laughs> you can flip the bird for like here. <laughs> okay. Um, and I just, the last time I forgot to do it, and I just want to send, send out a shout to Marvine. I spoke to him yesterday, and he is one of those very rare people who told me I'm a medieval type person. You use my material. You don't have to refer reference me. I don't think that is right. Um, a lot of this is based on a lecture series by, my, by Marvine from the Pony Radio. They have moved to a new platform since then. And I'm going to post a link below this video to their um, new series that they have on their own YouTube channel. But it is in Russian, just heads up. Um, so last time, the few things we did not finish on the basic idea of spirits in shamanism and archaic religions or more historical religions. I just a couple little things. One of them is the carnival culture. Carnival culture is something that is very um, known for us today in, um, you know, Venetian carnivals. It's something that's fun. That's something that's very joyful, celebratory, where people wear masks. Very similar concept applies to Halloween, um, you know, the Day of the Dead in Mexico. All of those stem from the same very basic shamanistic um, concept, animistic concept. And that is the idea that spirits on the other side cannot communicate with majority of people. And so once a year, sometimes twice a year, majority of tribes who practice these sort of um, beliefs, who live in a world that's populated by spirits, spirits and other creatures that are not material, they basically, the shamans lead the entire tribe into the other side, or rather they open up the gate between the two worlds and allow the spirits, the positive spirits to mingle with the people on this side, or in some cultures, quite the opposite, they try to chase them off or hide from them by wearing scary masks. And uh, usually in very um, hi historic kind of more down to earth kind of tribes, this practice is done in a way where everybody in the tribe has to participate. Absolutely every man, woman and child who is in the tribe should be and who is physically capable of participating should take part in this because it is that one time when everybody can see the other side, feel the other side, or at least vicariously experience the other side through the experiences, experiences of other people around them. Um, and sometimes with that particular behavior, there's a weird sexual either prohibitions or on the other, on the other hand, encouragements that take place. So for example, um, in Mongolian culture, they have this carnival once a year and everybody who's able participates in it. And you're not supposed to be having sex during this time period because the spirits on the other side, they can get extremely excited by those intense human emotions. And that can lead to all kinds of trouble and, and problems. And so people don't participate in sex. To where in some of the later cultures and some of the other cultures, as we know from the Venetian carnival, sex was a very much a part of that uh, celebration so that the spirits on the other side could actually experience what it is like to be physical and be human. Um, so that's an, one of the little things that we didn't finish up. The other little thing that we didn't finish up is the topography and the time of the other reality. So the topography and the time of the other reality is not identical to the one in this world. But there are certain items, certain locations that, are, that exist in both worlds, and those are usually the places of power. For example, again in Mongolia, Mount, mountain Bagdaul, which is the holy mountain, um, of the Mongols, it exists in both worlds. And you probably remember that in the last episode, we talked a little bit about the um, black shaman Tanjan. 
um, who had the spirit lover, the male spirit lover of Kurulan. And when him and Kurulan would do joint operations, I guess. For example, if Kurulan was having a battle with enemies on his side of reality, and he wanted his friend Tangen to help him out, they would have strategic plans. Tangent would travel by foot in this world to a specific meeting location and suddenly appear in the other world, smack in the middle of, of the battle and hit the enemies in, in the back. So those are the kinds of things that happen with uh, topography. And time also can flow very slowly or very quickly. Um, I was reading this fictional book, and this is not by any means an ethnographic book, but it's, they describe the concept very well where the fictional shaman would, he explained how he worked with the spirits because he worked mainly with small unattached spirits. He would, he, he described it as kind of putting up a job offer and just letting, basically, this is what I need done. This is how much I'm willing to give for it. Anybody who's willing to help respond. And the way that he explained it is that he didn't understand how the time worked on the other side, but it seemed like a lot of spirits had a chance to read the job offer, to consider it and respond within seconds. So there's that disparity between the time and space. And finally, I mentioned the whole thing about the Game of Thrones last time, and I didn't really go in depth about it. And I mentioned it in correlation to having relationships with a, a spirit on the other side, any kind of a relationship, whether it is a friendship, whether it is you know, servitude one way or the other, whether it is a romance. What I meant by the Game of Thrones in that case is that just like with a person, if you have a best friend, it is understood and it is implied that you're going to be there for your best friend. So let's say you're a shaman and you meet a spirit. Let's say your great spirit, the winged lion, and you become best friends and brothers. Well, the winged lion has his own friends, family, enemies, uh, people he's trying to overthrow, people who might try to eat him. So you now have all these relationships and attachment to your relationship with your own specific spirit that you're interacting with. So if your spirit brother or your spirit friend is having troubles on the other side, he or she might come screaming for help. And your job as a decent individual would be to do absolutely everything within your power to try to help him or her combat the threat on the other side. Or for example, your spirit's best friend can come to you and say, hey, I'm such and such, I know such and such, and I'm having problems, help me out. And it's kind of political relationship, very complicated network of relationships that you have to keep in mind. By the same token, you can do the same as the spirits. You can ask your spirit friend or friends of your spirit friend to come and assist people you care about in this world. So you just with having one spirit associate, you acquire this whole complicated political network of beings that are, go from really sweet and innocent to potentially enormous, powerful, and very dangerous. So that's just always something to keep in mind. And the last couple of things. Um, so uh, sacrifice in uh, shamanism is usually not, sacrifice, whether human or animal, is not a source of power in itself, usually. Sacrifice does not make a spirit do anything, but sacrifice does. Let's say you sacrifice a hot dog to your spirit on the other side. Well, now they have a hot dog on the other side. Well, they're going to eat a hot dog. They might really like the hot dog but nothing special is gonna be gained from this hot dog. There's not an extreme symbolic meaning to it. Um, sometimes very intense sacrifices are done. They're almost like beacons to attract the spirit on the other side to just get their attention. Um, and for God. Yeah, for gods, it's very different. For gods, sacrifice is a whole different subject matter. Uh, that's a religion. And that, that's where you get the whole concept of killing weapons or killing objects, where you find entire Viking hordes when you have swords that are twisted and broken and, you know, bent out of shape. If you want to give your spirit or your dead relative something in the other world, you want to kill it. So, you, you know, your grandpa is dead and your grandpa's favorite cane is now dead. And it's now in the other world and now your grandpa has his favorite cane. So that's what our archaeologists really love that because that means we get a lot of really cool items that are just kind of broken and twisted and buried as is. And um, yeah, that's about everything that I wanted to finish on the previous episode. Does anybody want to say anything? Um, uh, just a couple of points. Again, I don't have any actual uh, citable material, but um, 
One of the things that I did find interesting about uh, this area here where I live is there are multiple, these are just anecdotes, okay? These aren't hard evidence or anything, but it kind of goes back a little bit into the uh, connecting with uh, spirits and the politics that would go in the other spirit world. There's a location I won't name where multiple people actually saw an event and it was maybe revealed to them for some reason which I always thought was just kind of interesting because these are people that never talk to each other, but in the same area, which is a very special area, actually, they would witness the same, uh, it was a battle, actually. But I always thought that that was kind of interesting, and it's similar to what other stories I've heard in the shamanistic belief systems have. Um, the other thing about the objects, I'm not really familiar that much with destroying, say, uh, a weapon or a tool to give it to the other side. That's a little bit of a new concept to me. Okay, so let's move on to our next episode, and that is, um, you know, shamanism and our many souls. And it's, again, it's very basic concepts for understanding human mentality throughout the ages in various religions, various cultures, all the way through the modern times. So imagine this picture. You know, it's cold somewhere in the north of Eurasia. And there is a little tent or hut. And in this tent or hut, there's an old man, a dead old man lying in, on his bed. And next to him sits his dear old wife. And she's talking to him. And she's saying, husband, you've been gone for five days now. The snow has fallen. Our children are doing well. Your daughter is getting married next week. The shaman is coming soon. You know, your best friend, your best friend, Bayer, he has passed too. And when the shaman comes, you and Bayer both will take a journey together. You and your best friend will go together to the other side. And then she sings to, her, to him. And then she, you know, tells him everything that she didn't get a chance to tell him before he passed. All those things that we often regret we didn't get a chance to tell to our loved ones. You know, you remember when I was mad at you for not coming home when I wanted you to come home? Well, I've forgiven you for it. And then the daughter comes in and she takes the mother's place and she sings songs to the father's body. And this goes on for days, sometimes weeks, sometimes a month. This is a, one of the ways that people say goodbye to their dead. It's an, a ritual that we will come to a little bit later in the podcast. But it's a very touching um, human experience. And I think a very a psychotherapist who written about this particular ethnographic phenomenon of this practice of the farewell ritual, when the family members have to sit, they don't have to sit, they just sit by their loved one's death bedside until such time that a shaman is able to come and collect all the dead souls in the particular settlement or in a particular location. Because they don't think that... Um, a soul can really safely make it over to the other side on their own. And also, they if you don't talk to your loved one's soul, which kind of is disoriented and it's hanging around its body, you know, he or she might wander off and just get lost. And then you will have a really hard time finding them and helping them. And so they sit there, they talk and talk, and they take turns. And if suddenly they feel that their loved one shadow, their soul is starting to disappear, they wake up the rest of the family and everybody starts running around and saying, do you see grandpa? Where's grandpa? Where did grandpa go? Until somebody can sense grandpa again and, you know, talk to grandpa and return grandpa back to his body until such a time that he can have a proper journey to the other side. So that's, like I said, that's just one of the practi practices that happen around the world. A lot of different people have different ways of understanding what death is, what souls are, and what a soul is comprised of and what a shaman's role is in those events. So, of course, animals. This, is, this part is going to be debated by some biologists. It's not gonna be debated by others. It really depends on which zoopsychologist, which particular individual scientist you ask regarding this. But I think it's well beyond argument at this point in time that not just anecdotally, but even um, there's statistical data that animals understand death and to a certain degree understand the concept of afterlife. Uh, we've all heard about um, elephants who revisit the places where their loved ones, where their members of their group have died, who perform certain gestures. For example, they will touch the middle of the forehead with their trunk. 
um, which is a gesture that elephants do with each other when they want to greet each other. It's a very intimate, loving gesture. Moreover, they will bring young elephants to those bones. And when you see an elephant, um, you know, gently touching a skull of a long since dead elephant that that elephant knew once, or maybe didn't even know personally, but whose, whose gravesite it's been brought to by its parents. You know, it's one of the two things. Either they have a concept of some sort of afterlife, or they have complex ritual behavior that we don't understand anything about. Um, another example is, um, you know, the gorilla Coco. Um, again, controversial subject, I believe in it. Uh, and the story of her little kitten. How, you guys heard about that? Coco was a captive gorilla that was taught how to sign. She developed a really good vocabulary. She was probably the most talented gorilla ever. And she, at one point in time, got a kitten. She liked cats and she, they brought her little baby kitten and she called it Old Ball in gorilla sign language. And she really loved Old Ball because he was so bouncy. Well, one day Old Ball got out, got hit by a car and died. And so, you know, Coco was very sad. She was grieving for days. And one of the researchers who was working with Coco, you know, thought to ask her, what did she think happened to Old Ball now that Old Ball was dead? And Coco said, he left. He left and will not return. He left beyond us somewhere at the faraway pastures. Now that's an ape talking. Personal experience, I had sugar gliders, um, a boy and a girl that were very bonded. And uh, when the boy was extremely ill and he had, I had to, he was suffering, he had to, you know, be let go. And so I took him and his um, female together to the vet. So she knew that I didn't just kidnap him, that she knew that he has passed away. And, um, you know, they put him down and then brought the body back and let her kind of say goodbye to him. And she sat there and she patted the body on the head. And then when we, when I brought her home that night, I have never seen anything like that because this is not a behavior that sugar gliders normally display or a sound that they make, but they have little feet like and hands that kind of like human hands and monkey hands. She was sitting there holding the bars and just banging her head against the bars and just wailing that widow's wail. I think that all of us, one way or another, have experienced uh, the idea that animals do understand death. They do understand the finality of it. And some animals even show some sort of um, belief that there is death, life after death or some sort of continuation of existence. Now, concepts of a soul exist in every form of human belief, except for very modern militant atheism. And I would argue that even in militant atheism, it still exists, only in the sense that atheists violently deny its possibility, which in a way is admitting its existence anyway. Um, all children believe that they are mortal. If you ask any little kid, even, even if a child who has seen or experienced death of a relative or a pet, um, they don't believe that they are capable of dying. So this idea that our personality, our essence, what makes us us, will somehow continue on beyond the mortal existence is very much a part of human nature. And uh, another thing that I think collaborates the idea that this is a very basic uh, human, and, not, and I, I, I would argue beyond human, you know, higher animal trait. I remember I've mentioned the mythology, well, he's not a mythologist, the mythology database that, uh, you know, scientist Biroskin had compiled, where he traced the migration of humans out of Africa through collecting snippets of little mythos that incorporated into various, I guess, creation stories, you know, reality explanation stories that people have. Well, by, by their dating, basically, the very first, as far as they can derive, the very first mythos, the very first um, kind of tale that humans came up with was explanation of where did death come from? Why do people die? So that, that seems to be like the very, very first invented human um, mythological concept. Um, so like I said, the ideas of what a soul is and the ideas of what the other life is are very diverse from one culture to another, to the point where two neighboring tribes that have been living together, you know, next side by side for a couple thousand of years and actively exchanging culturally may have completely opposite ideas of what it means to die, where you go when you die and what your soul is. But everybody, so the, the few generalizations that can be made is first of all, souls do exist in one way or another. Um, the, Typically, a soul does not, the essence, we'll just call it soul for lack of a better umbrella term, 
generally sticks around with the body or the or the location of uh, usually should not stick correction usually should not stick around with the body or the location of death in other words that once a person dies their soul should go elsewhere unless it is intentionally through specific ritual with purpose tied to specific location or their body which is practiced in some forms of uh, you know belief systems and lastly if it stays with the body or the location of death that's not a good thing that's how you get your hauntings and other negative spirits and in archaic um, forms of shamanistic beliefs animistic beliefs etc there's really no such thing as heaven or hell those are fairly late concepts uh typically all souls went to um a specific location or locations but it was not divided into good or bad there was not a moralistic quality to it uh, so where do souls go well, first of all, the concept of reincarnation is very common in a lot of cultures. And it seems that it's something that even, you know, cultures like Neanderthals had, because over and over we see situations where people are buried in specific positions. Even Neanderthals are buried in specific positions, either a sleeping position or the embryo pose. Another interesting cultural detail you all know that whenever a person is buried when they put the dirt on top of the grave they leave a little bit of a mound on top does anybody know why that's done what's the purpose of that mound why why it's not just flat with the surface of the of the soil i've always been curious about that especially after the last burial but i have always just assumed that it was displacement and that you wanted to make it mm -hmm. seen but that was just what i always figured jake well, because the uh, earth is, uh, when you dig it up, it's nice and packed, and there's a lot of pressure on it, but when you put it back in, unless you tamp it back down, if you make it flat, all of a sudden you have a concave uh, over the uh, grave site. And sometimes you can see that with some old um, uh, burials where they had wooden caskets before, now we have vault. In Ohio, we have to have a vault, a concrete vault. But as the casket deteriorates and collapses, the dirt goes down. It's not uncommon to go through an old cemetery and see the depressions where the earth is compacted and also, in the case, the casket uh, thoroughly um, uh, got uh, rotten and, and dissolved and the earth uh, went down even more. That's why you have a mound instead of uh, uh, having it level. Also, it could be to make it harder for the animals to dig it up. It used to be a problem especially if you did not have time to dig six foot down and you could only do a shallow grave and um, you would have a mound, but then you put rocks on top of it to deter animals from uh, digging things up. And that you're absolutely right from the practical point of view, but that does not explain, for example, Scythian or Viking kurgans, you know, burial mounds, which go way above and beyond what, what, is, what is required for the settling soil. The actual myth, like the spiritual, mythical, um, if you want to say sacred reason for that is because the earth is pregnant. And that is the pregnant belly of the earth. And that is one of the symbolic reasons why you, when you, if you enter somebody in the ground, why you want to create that rounded pregnant belly sort of appearance. And moreover, there are certain burials, for example, in, um, you know, on the British Isles and a lot of different places that are explicitly shaped as a female um, basically reproductive organs to where the interred person, the corpse is in the center of what would have been the womb. And then you have the vaginal passage and so on and so forth. So that the soul literally has to be reborn. And that's one of those meanings that is very deeply seated within our psyche that we have long since forgotten what the meaning of it was. And we think about it in practical terms in our very practical age, but there is that sacred understanding behind it that you, you are expecting that soul to be reborn and you're expecting the afterlife. Um, so, and another thing with, with the souls that is fairly common in a lot of, um, a lot of forms of belief is that a soul, in re, for example, in, in reincarnation, well, if I'm reincarnated, well, how come I don't remember my last life is what a lot of people ask, right? Well, it's because death is traumatic. It's a horribly traumatic experience. And a lot of cultures believe that the trauma of death, unless you're a super powerful spirit or a super powerful shaman or leader or some sort of an outstanding individual, Jake, I hear you, um, that you are going to be... Um, basically forget everything because you just went through a horrible, horrible traumatic experience. Jake, go ahead. And in Ohio, we have a lot of uh, burial mounds. 
Uh, some of them are 30, 40 feet high, and they were built with a purpose. There are different layers inside they found it. They have not excavated a lot of them, but uh, Serpent Mound was interesting to go to. You actually have to climb the tower because I think it's 1,300 a foot long or approximately, uh, what would that be, uh, 300 some odd meters? Very, very big, right? Yes. All right, so reincarnations, we can have two types of reincarnations. There's immediate reincarnation and then there is delayed reincarnation. Um, immediate re reincarnation, some of the examples of are, for example, a Tibetan a Dalai Lama, when a Dalai Lama passes away, um, they start searching for a newborn um, immediately who is marked to take the place of that individual. Um, another um, example is Aborigines. It, not so much example is an interesting view. Aborigines, um, Australian Aborigines, and actually quite a few other cultures believe that a person can be reincarnated immediately, but not necessarily in Australia, for example. And what is interesting, because Australian Aborigines at the time of their discovery were separated from all other human populations by a very long period of time and space. Nonetheless, they had ancestral memory that there existed other worlds beyond the Great Sea. And they did believe that some souls, if they didn't get reincarnated immediately, here in this location, they could possibly get reincarnated elsewhere. And that was probably not a very happy place for you to get reincarnated. And another thing that stems from that belief of immediate reincarnation, for example, in Russian, uh, well, in Slavic traditional uh, naming convention, I believe in Germanic, that was the case too until Middle Ages. So if, you, if you, it's typical to name, to reuse the same name in a ruling dynasty, but you never want to name a son after a father unless the father is already dead. In other words, you're going to pick another male relative that is already deceased and name the child after a dead relative because the, with that comes the idea that with the name passes the soul of that individual that has passed away. And so that's in Western culture that kind of got forgotten and put aside a little bit earlier than it did in the Slavic cultures, but it did used to be common convention that you never named the father and the son the same name. It was just horrible luck. You might have as well just sign a death sentence for the father. Um, now, delayed reincarnation. Um, for example, Evenki, again, we're going to have a lot of Evenki in this particular podcast. They're also known as Tungusas. Um, their soul goes to a whole separate dead world. So when you die, your soul goes to the world for dead people, which is a separate world, and you live there for a while. And it's a lot like our world, almost identical, but you live a whole life there, then you die there, and you get reincarnated again in the spirit world. And then you live in the spirit world for a while, and if you choose to, you can go ahead and get reincarnated back in our world. So yes, a soul can come back and get reincarnated as a living person here in this reality, but it's A, their choice, which we will see reoccur later in other cultures, and B, they have to go through these steps before they can get there, and it's not immediate. Um, so it's kind of like a wheel of existences, I guess. Um, now, there can be a non-reincarnation concept. Some African cultures, for example, believe that you only live a single life, or a lot of modern religions believe that you live only a single life, and then you just go to the designated dead place, or place for the dead. Now, how does hierarchy, like, what is your station, I guess, what is your capability in the afterlife? Well, again, that greatly varies from culture to culture, what determines that. For example, we all know that Vikings' main thing that they valued was A, charisma, luck, right? And basically how much praise or how much fame they had from other people around them. That's another recurring motif. So for, and you didn't have to be a great warrior. You didn't have to be a great leader. You, for example, you could have invented a great way to grow more wheat. And if you did that, that and people talked about you, you know, through the fjords and villages all around, then you, that would add to your weight in the afterlife. You would be born with more capital, I guess, in a way. You would be more meaningful in the afterlife. Um, early Hindus, very early Hindus, they believed that your station in the afterlife comprised of two things. One, how much you have suffered physically, and not just physically, but physically and otherwise, in this life, and how much suffering you inflicted in this life combined which made for a very interesting society. Mosai, um, if, um, in their culture, shamans um, typically are right at the ruling top. They're the elite of the afterlife world to where normal people, they, once they die, they have to, they can continue learning and they can get to the top of that society, but they start, you know, you basically start at entry level. Um, Sumerians, Greeks, 
very early Greeks, in their concept of afterlife, everybody was equal. Everybody's afterlife just seriously sucked. I mean, you died and then you were a shade without any rights and without any hope for improvement and without any real hierarchy, you just kind of floated around. Not a very happy afterlife, which is one of the reasons why Greeks so eagerly converted to Christianity much later on. Um, Bonto and Buji, uh, people of Congo, they believe that everybody is going to be great, wonderful, and absolutely happy in afterlife, which gives them a lot of bravery. Well, used to give them in more archaic times a lot of bravery in combat and little fear of death. But it, everybody, regardless of how you lived in this life, in this world, or what you did with your life, everybody was going to be absolutely happy. And then um, another way that you can gain a high status in afterlife is if you have somebody who's your protector on the other side. And that's something we touched on a little bit in the last podcast. So if you have a lover spirit or a friend spirit or an enemy spirit waiting for you on the other side or a relative who has passed before you, who is going to greet you and kind of bring you into the society, you can skip through certain stages of having to go up through the hierarchy. How do you cross over? That's another thing. So how does a soul, you die, how does your soul go from here to there? Well, one of the options is, for example, Buryats, Mongols, Mordvines, Mord, Mard, Mardvine. It's a Finno-Ugoric tribe, um, currently lives on territory of you know, Russian Federation. But in a lot of Finno-Ugoric tribes, um, you require a shaman. You cannot get over without a shaman's assistance. Um, and the shamans directed the death actively. In other words, shaman came, found the dead soul, and walked them over to the other side. Um, in other cultures, for example, uh, people can get there by themselves. Well, shamans can get there by themselves, but people can't. Um, in some cultures, you, you require no assistance at all. You just automatically get basically sent off to the other side and you don't need anybody's interference. And these ideas can be so different. There's a peoples that in Russian literature, political documentation, they're called as the peoples of Hanta Mansi. But these are actually two tribes that have merged, I don't know how many hundred years ago. They to, to the point where Hanta Mansi is now considered to be a single tribe. Well, they are not a single tribe and they have different beliefs. For example, Hanta believe that if there's no shaman, you're gonna turn into a ghost, you're gonna be miserable, floating around, harming people, you require a shaman. Um, but Mansi believe that a shaman does not have to take any active action. Like in other words, you don't have to tend to a specific dead. What you have to do is serve as a beacon. You know, once in X amount of time, you have to perform a specific ritual and that brings all the floating ghosts around you to you. And then you channel them all to wherever it is that they're going. So again, two, two nations that are so merged, most people even think of them as the same tribe, but they have completely different beliefs. Um, uh, just a, Go ahead, Julie, but I was going to interject something there in a moment. Go right okay, ahead. About, um, now, yeah, you're right. As far as I can tell, every culture is actually just very diverse in terms of uh, what the shaman actually does need to do in order to help a soul make the journey versus, you know, maybe the journey doesn't go as well. But, um, of course, a lot of tribes are just, they're just lumped together. And uh, everybody thinks that, well, they all believe the same thing that in Native American culture, at uh -huh. least, that is not true. Like with the, uh, you know, the Sioux, there are many flavors of Sioux. And like with the Klamath, uh, Klamath is one tribe. You also have Modoc, you have Yehuskin, they, they're all different. They all have different beliefs. I wish that I knew more about them. But... Um, it seems that whether a shaman is present or not, most cultures have always believed that there has to be something going on. Not always, every culture is different, but the soul has to make a journey. And of course, that's why, I mean, it's a personal thing, but I mean, I, I visit grave sites as well, and I leave things that they enjoyed in life because, well, I want them to have a good journey. <laughs> and a lot of people do enjoy this. It's just, I don't know why, but we do. It's very common in all religion, even modern religion, but shamanic religion, of course, we did it also. But that's all I had to say. Fantastic. You know, and I just want to say that one thing that seems to be a common theme going through a lot of these beliefs and something that I personally believe with all my heart, and this is the reason why I believe it is so important to remember our fallen heroes, our fallen dead, warriors who fought for us relatives who loved us, 
you know, our friends and our family who died young. I, I personally believe, and it's, it's something that in a red thread goes throughout history, is that a person exists in the afterlife for as long as somebody here remembers them. Ray Bradbury has a beautiful novel about that. Uh, to where their dead poets up on Mars, and uh, as soon as their last of their books gets burned, each poet just goes poof. But I think that it's very, it gives ghosts, for lack of a better term, those, I mean, regardless of whether you believe in anything mythical or not, I think that as long as enough people think about an individual really, in, even in a materialistic way, their memory is still present, so they're still present with us. So, um, I mean, that's definitely, it's important, I think it's important to pass on the memory and to tell your children the stories of your grand, you know, grandparents and to tell your children the stories of the fallen heroes from wars long ago because as long as their name is spoken, Egyptians have the same concept as long as the name is spoken, as, as long as you mentioned you exist. Now, um, hold on, I just wanted to interject one other thing also, I'll make it, I'll make it very quick, but mm -hmm. also, um, if you are treating an enemy that you actually thought was truly an enemy combatant, you would bury them often sometimes a little bit differently than you would a friend. And the whole reason is that you don't want them to come back. Absolutely. And by the way, you know, the endless history channel documentaries about Hitler. Yeah. About that. Just something to think about. Fenris, did you want to say something? Yeah. You know, I, I agree with, uh, with what you're saying about uh, keeping up our family and our friends and fallen heroes alive in our thoughts and in our hearts. And uh, one of the things I really like about Shinto faith is they have a, uh, a family shrine set up that, where they have mementos and photographs of family members. And it isn't just that, but uh, they put a little bowl of rice out, a little bit of water, and I did that for a while, uh, you know, back uh, back in the 80s, and uh, I got some really interesting uh, results from it. Um, one time, I came back from work, and I had a little small barrel cactus sitting on my wind on my windowsill, and it was laying down next to the, next to the flower pot, and then all the books on my bookshelves, specific ones, were on the floor. Okay. And these were books that I was meant to read, and I did read them. And uh, I kept that shrine going for about a year, and then I just moved on. But I still keep the family right here in my heart. They all live here. And, you know, we communicate on a regular basis. Absolutely. Okay, and so, I, you know that story I told at the beginning of uh, the very conversation about the dead when uh, the, the whole saying for well ritual where the whole family of a deceased person and a tribe takes turns basically attending to them as if it was somebody in a coma talking to them reading to them if they have gotten that far a lot of them have books and television now you know, uh, telling them about the news and the you know and the family and the tribe and the world well what happens when an actual shaman arrives in the tribe to collect all the dead is that they, in Evenki culture, they believe that your passage to the afterlife goes along a kind of a spiritual river. And so the shaman puts, he brings a special boat now, of course it's on land, it's not because it's a spiritual river, it's not a physical river. And we you know with oars and the shaman gets in, in the boat and all the dead get placed into their little boats, you know, the remains, even if it happens to be all that's left is just a skeleton, whatever is you know, left of the dead. And then the shaman, begins the ritual and of course all the family members are looking on and the shaman tells the family members about every aspect of the journey you know how they you know sailed off how they turned you know the river bend how they came across an island their tri trials tribulations their arrival to the world of the spirit and then he introduces each deceased individual to the spirits on the other side he says oh this is bazir Bazir was a good man. Bazir has a wife and three children. Bazir, let's say, he was a, I don't know, a deer herder in his life. He was um, a skilled singer or a skilled dancer. He was a kind man. Um, he is a great man. Please meet him with respect. Please allow him to join you in the afterlife. And so uh, a shaman has to have fairly darn good memory because by the time a shaman might make it to a remote village, there may be several dead people there and you have to remember their names, the names of their family, 
you know, everything about them. So it, it, but that introduction ritual is very important and the at physical, almost physical participation of the family members in that for well, in that last journey to where they see their loved one actually cross over to the other side, makes them, and sometimes he'll say, oh, Vazir, Vazir, look, there's your old wife. She's been waiting for you for five years. She's been coming, you know, every day and saying, hey, where's my husband? And finally, finally, Vazir, you know, you're here. So they see this kind of reunion and it's, it's very almost therapeutic. So I think it's a very awesome custom. Chukchas, which is another tribe of very different peoples. Um, we will talk about Chukchas separately when we get to Siberian history. Very warlike tribe, one of the most milita militaristic warlike tribes in history of the North, North Eurasia. Um, awesome, awesome peoples. Uh, they believe that a body has to be destroyed in order for the soul to cross over. Completely and utterly destroyed. Torn into pieces, into little shreds, destroyed, stomped down, chopped up. Uh, when the Russians came and conquered that part, um, of the north of course they outlawed that practice because back then of whatever century it was 17 or so some such you know of course you know they saw that as barbaric which actually caused an uprising among the chukchas and the chukcha uprising is no joke okay the chukcha uprising is death to destruction trash and you know gutted bodies everywhere but uh, eventually they came to kind of a compromise to where now they just dispose of their bodies into the sea those who still practice the traditional faith um um, let's see who else. Okay, by the way, from that same concept, and there's that's not the only culture that has that concept that the body has to be destroyed to release the soul. And kind of connected to that is the whole practice of funerary cannibalism, to where in some cultures the deceased loved one needs to be basically literally consumed by the survivors. First of all, to reabsorb the ancestral spirit into the lineage. Second of all, to get rid of that body so that the spirit is not attached to anything physical anymore. And for example, um, in one of the cultures, I can't remember which one, uh, you know, all the family members take turns taking a bite and because each bite you take, you recall the specific memory of that person's life. For example, something good, like, you know, when I was 10 years old, he helped me carve, I don't know, a wooden spoon. But when I was 18 years old, he forbade me from marrying my, you know, my sweetheart. But they all tell a little story about the person that they're saying for well to was every bite of the flesh they take. And that, of course, uh, you know, mutates into the very, very well-known practice of consuming your dead enemy. And I really don't want to get in trouble for bringing up colonial past, but Captain Cook, um, when he got accidentally killed and partially consumed, and that situation was completely misunderstood by the Western authorities, um, the people who did it, did it out of utmost respect to him as a wise man and a friend of the people. Um, but, um, you know, in some cultures, specific body parts represent specific um, qualities of a person. So, for example, if grandpa was a very wise man, you might want to, I don't know, eat his brain. Or if he was an outstanding singer, you may want to eat his tongue. And if he was just a horrible, horrible, you know, just bad with his hands, just couldn't make a darn thing without ruining it, you probably do not want to touch the hands, you know. And um, another thing was consuming your dead enemy. And again, this is a meme that comes up over and over when a, a warrior kills another warrior, chops out the liver and takes a bite. The heart or the liver, you, very often it is the liver. Um, liver seems to be associated with a lot of things in a lot of different cultures specifically, not to mention it's highly nutritious. But uh, when you take a bite of that liver, you have, it's on the one hand, it's an action of, you know, victory over a triumph over an enemy. On the other hand, the moment you do that, you're blood brothers. You're literally blood brothers. And you have all the obligation that in, you know, traditional cultures, such a ritual would have with it. Again, I'm going to refer to a fictional work that I think describes it very well. Uh, in this fictional work, uh, the main character, he was a Scythian warrior and he wound up killing another warrior early on in the book series and he took a bite out, out of, his, of the enemy's liver. Well, later on through this, plot of the story, him and his friends wound up in the afterworld, they were searching for some treasure, whatever, and they were being attacked by these zombies, and suddenly, out of nowhere, you know, these other Scythian warriors, whole tribe of them, comes riding out and saves this group, and they're standing there going, what's going on, why are these dead helping us against the other dead, what's going on, and then the leader of the dead comes out and says, remember me, well, no, I don't, well, you killed me, and you took a bite of my liver, and now we are bound by the bonds of that blood brotherhood. I have no choice but to, but to come to your aid. Again, that's a fictional story, but it's a fictional story written by somebody who understands some of those traditional practices very well. And they obligate, so when you consume a part of your enemy's flesh, you have obligations towards that individual soul 
in this life and in the, in the afterlife. So consuming your enemy can be an equivalent to, you know, giving, for example, you know, during the Napoleonic Wars, sometimes an opposite army commander would be killed in battle and the other side, the enemy side would give them an honorable and kind of a very pompous funeral. It's the same sort of idea of respect. And you probably do not want to eat people that you want to have nothing to do with. It's probably not going to do you an awful lot of good. Um, now, lost souls in majority of cultures, I, I would say almost in all cultures, is so, it's something that's, you know, ghosts, basically. Ghosts, lost souls, uh, they're the domain of the shaman. That's one of the main things that a shaman needs to deal with, to, is to find those lost souls that can morph and evolve into really evil entities and calm them and pacify them and help them safely cross over. That's one, of, I'd say it's one of the job descriptions of shamans on a lot of cultures. Now, so what is a soul? This is where stuff gets really interesting. Okay, in Scandinavia, you know, Scandinavian cultures, as, as I have mentioned before, your soul consists of your luck, your charisma, your reputation, your fame. And by the way, um, and also, how much loot you have gathered throughout your life, which is one of the reasons why very successful Scandinavian warlords did not tend to leave their monetary goods to their offspring. They oftentimes would be buried with like six or seven chests of gold or silver. Well, it's because that's my luck. That's my charisma. You go get your own. I, you can't pass it over. It's, it's a part of what their soul consists of, that success. It's part of their success, basically. Um, Hans, you know, very interesting concept of the soul. So, in, in, in the, and of course, we only know the mythology of the Hans through some very, um, no, I wouldn't say bias, just time, time frame delayed Hungarian um, reminiscence of a memory of when they were Hans long time ago, far, far away in a galaxy, far from ours. But there's some tales that do survive. And from those tales, there's some things that we can derive about what the Hans believed in. Um, they believed that your soul was made up of your personality as you are, plus fragments of souls of every person you've ever killed. And so the more people you pers as a person kill in your life, the more yourself gets diluted in the sea of fractions of other personalities. And things get very interesting with that. For example, um, you can get completely lost in that and just stop being yourself. You're just going to become this conglomeration of, you know, fractured, broken pieces. You can stop being a Hun as a result of this. If you, for example, go around killing a lot of Romans and you kill a lot, a lot of Romans, eventually the weight of the Romans is going to outweigh your hunt them and you're going to stop being in essence the, the the person of the tribe that you came from um if you kill too many bad people that's a real problem you have to kill good people periodically it's essential to kill people of your own tribe and people who are good and virtuous people because if you kill too many bad people you are going to mutate into a monster there's actually a story about attila the hun by the way attila what it means it literally means father all um because Attila has killed so many people and, and he killed a lot of Huns. He made, it, he made it a regular practice to kill his own tribesmen and kinsmen in order to keep himself as a part of the Hun culture. And that's at one point, at some point in time, he, he, his self got pretty much diluted in that completely. He just became all of the Huns, like kind of an overpresence. But there was a point in time when he was doing war on some traitors within his own, I'm not going to go into details, but some of his sons rose up against him. There was a rebellion. There was just a bunch of evil done. So he executed the people who were involved in these evil crimes. And then suddenly after that, he just, he, he turned into psychomaniac. You know, he just started murdering people for absolutely no reason, left and right. And it was, everybody was afraid of him, even his closest surrounding. And so one of the shamans in their tribe came to Attila and said, and the shaman was known for being a very good man, just a kind decent, very respected man. And he was an old man and he had a huge reputation among the Huns. And he came to him and he said, Attila, you need to kill me. I beg you, please kill me. Kill me right now. Because if you don't take my soul right now and if you don't balance the good and the e evil within yourself, you're going to turn into a monster. And of course, Attila killed him and then he stopped acting in a completely irrational kind of psychotic manner. Just a very interesting concept to have. Um, let's see. Mongols. Um, Mongols believe pretty much that your, your soul is yourself, except that Mongols and related peoples, they have this idea of a shadow or a shade, which again occurs in quite a few of those cultures, you know, the Asian Siberian cultures, where 
it's your imprint on the world. So in other words, use your soul. I'm going to use another fictional story to explain what I mean. There was a it was written during the whole perestroika collapse of Soviet Union time, but it, it, the story went like this. There was a guy who came up with, with a way. So if a person lives in a house for long enough, they kind of leave imprints on the surrounding objects and everything, the couch, the walls, the canary, everything. In your place of dwelling, you leave an imprint on. And this guy came up with an idea to basically photograph that imprint, put it together kind of like a 3D construct, and then put it into this bath of biological matter and resurrect the person, not as they were at the time of death, but as they were at the time of, um, you know, when the imprint most, was most powerful. And sometimes weird things would happen. For example, a woman who was being resurrected got resurrected together with her pet cat, you know? But that's, that's what a shadow is. Shadow is your imprint on this world. It's separate from you, it exists separate from you. You go on to afterlife, but the imprint exists here for as long for as powerful as you were, for as much of an impact as you left, and as much as people around you remember you. So for example, Genghis Khan's imprint is gonna last probably for all eternity. Mm -hmm. But his is gonna last for a number of reasons. There's a whole bunch of things with Genghis. But if you just somebody who didn't impact a lot of people, nobody remembers you, you didn't leave much of an impression on your surroundings, your nature, your house, your friends, chances are your imprint is just gonna fade away. But your imprint is almost like a separate entity from you. It's your shadow, it's your twin in a way but it knows everything you know it you know it remembers everything you know harry potter for example uh, with the soul stone when he did that resurrection what he did is he summoned that shadow not the actual souls of the dead which are often afterlife but the shadow that imprint echo um again back to Ivenki. they the soul in Ivenki has three parts and their concept of the soul is very close to the ancient egyptian one which is interesting because where is Evenki and where is, you know, ancient Egypt, but it's a three-part concept. So your soul consists of, first of all, the same concept, that your shadow. And shadow is basically your life experiences, your memories, um, and the uh, memories of you and the memories that you've had. It's the sum of your experiences during your life, and it will fade with time. Then there's the ancestral soul, and that is a soul that's not yours to begin, as, be, begin with. It's a soul that was given to you at birth. And it oftentimes is represented as a bird that lives on the, on the ancestral tree. And all those birds, they're identical. And when a new child in that lineage is born, the bird flies into that child and brings everything that comes with the lineage. So what that soul consists of is genetics, hereditary stuff, anything that you have acquired through your birthright. And a person can have two or three ancestral souls at the same time. And those souls can have conflicts with each other. So for example, let's say that your mother was from the lineage of very skillful Smith, you know, and your father was from the lineage of very skillful singers. Well, you have two ancestral souls in you. They, they might exist in, you know, harmony, but you might wake up one morning and decide, you know, I don't want to be a Smith. It's not cool to be a Smith. I forget it. I just want to be singing all the time. Well, then you can actually conduct a ritual and exile, throw out, expunge that other soul that you do not desire. Now that's your personal choice. The tribe might not be very happy with, with you, or you know, in particular, your mother's tribe might not be particularly happy with you if you throw out that, you know, as that side of your basically bloodline. But it is your right, and once you can, uh, you know, conduct that ritual, you only have one ancestral soul left, and then you kind of vaguely remember how to do smithing, but you're gonna psychologically you're gonna think that you don't really know how to do it anymore. Like you are not pretty. It's almost like cutting off part of your genetics. Um, now shamans in that culture have no ancestral soul. It's because in order to become a shaman, what you have to do is literally rip the ancestral soul out of your body. And what it happens when you do that is first of all, you don't belong to any clan, lineage or family anymore. Your loyalty is now distributed among all the peoples. You're, you're equally loyal to your neighbors, you know, the tribe across from the river, you, you know, tribe on the other side of, you know, the oikomenos, I, 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 as uh, Greeks would say later on. You have no loyalty, you, you don't belong to any ancestral lineage at all. You have that hole and that hole is what the spirits come into your body through. It's very similar to the Germanic concept with that people, for example, who have lost an, a limb, um, they have with that kind of um, otherworldly limb. So for example, if a warrior had an arm chopped off in combat, you know, there's the idea that, you know, later on that he has an arm that's permanently on the other side. That's very similar, but in this case, it's almost like a void that the souls from the, the, the spirits from the other side can float into the shaman 
through and communicate with the shaman. Well, when the shaman passes away, he doesn't go, he doesn't do any of the things I'm describing. He gets yanked through as if like a void a vacuum onto the other side and to the, he goes directly to the spirit world. Through that hole, it goes shoo. And then finally, of course, there's your own soul. And your own soul is everything you've done, you've learned, you experienced in this life. Minus everything, minus the two of the above. So in other words, your ancestral soul goes back to the tree. So any tra traits, talents, uh, predispositions that you acquired through your parents and your family lineage, bye-bye. Anything that you learned yourself that's unique to you stays with you. And um, your shadow stays on this in this realm. So you almost get stripped of this life's experience in a way. I don't even know how to explain it. The present gets left in, in, in reality. The Everything that you acquired through your parents gets sent back to the ancestral tree. So what you're left with is just the bare minimum of you, what you are, what you are by yourself without all those external things. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it does. But what about, you know, certain things that you work on, certain causes, causes that you make in this existence? Uh, for example, you know, if someone was a, painter or a musician and would they carry that karma on into their next existence which i think that i would think that they would if it's uh, something they learned by themselves then yes but if it's something that their parents did because so for example if your mom was a painter and your grandma was a painter then no you will forget how to do that in, in the afterlife so, you will have to learn from scratch Okay, so it'd be more like someone who's an outlander painter, someone who learned, who's self-taught. Then you take it with you. Ah, okay. It's a very, very kind of complicated concept. And of course, in the afterlife, there are no children. No children are born in the afterlife. The only children that are born in the afterlife in this particular concept are the dead. And you appear in the afterlife physically as you were at the time of death. So for example, if, you, if you're a completely disabled old person, paralyzed and unable to move, you will appear in the afterlife. In, in that state and condition, but there will be relatives there. There will be, there's an idea of kind of social mutual support in the afterlife. So other spirits in the afterlife will come and help you and nurse you. And slowly over time, you will get gradually younger and young, younger and younger and any injuries will go away. Any limbs you may have lost will reappear. But for example, let's say a baby dies. Well, the baby on the other hand is gonna grow until everybody reaches kind of an average age of 20, 25, their optimal age. And that's how you exist in the afterlife. And that's, that's how it is. Um, so that's, that's one of the, probably the most complicated, um, concepts of, I lost, I lost a page somewhere, but that's probably one of the most concepts of afterlife that we know in, at least in the, you know, Siberian, uh, populations and tribes. That's all I was going to cover for today because that's quite a bit of information. I think we're going to continue with this a little bit more on, on the next uh, episode. Um, if, does anybody else want to jump in with anything else? I didn't have really a whole lot else to add, but um, that uh, concept of uh, the afterlife that you just described, that is a little bit new to me. That's not something that I'm actually familiar with. Um, like I said, I thought that I had some actual source material for uh, Native American concepts of afterlife, but they are very, they are varied a lot. But um, the concept of uh, the soul making a journey and what, what happens after death, I mean, specifically on the other side, even though it is varied, it seems like every, uh, every culture that I've ever studied, they do all have some kind of a story to tell, so to speak, about, well, yes, you do things on the other side also. It's, you don't just dissolve normally. You don't want to dissolve. You don't want your friends to dissolve. And I wanted to also mention that, um, I'm glad that you mentioned that when you uh, consume parts of an enemy, specifically their body, that is often a sign of respect. It is actually not disrespectful in some cultures. Yes. The old saying, you know, uh, make sure to eat their heart and gain their courage. But actually, you want their courage to live on because you respected them as an enemy. So thank you for bringing that up. Well, and you know, and it's the most intimate thing a person can really do in that sort of a culture. I mean, it's more intimate than sex. It's more intimate than anything else at all because you are becoming one with them, right? So you have to really have high regard for somebody in order to bring them into your very being. 
David, did you want to say something? Yeah. Okay, David's going to... Um, huh? Yeah, let me turn my microphone off so we're not doing the echoing. What I'm going to say is just that the reverse of that, if you take many of the plain tribes, the mutilation and the Celts, a lot of, a lot of peoples, um, the reverse of that is if you're not highly respected, uh, you may well be mutilated, and that is to cripple your soul in the, in the next world. Um, like I say, the Plains, uh, the, the North America, uh, Native Americans from the Central Plains were, were uh, very, very noted for that. And, and that's just kind of the reverse of it. Um, and, you know, I, I want to just make a statement. The reason why I have not mentioned Native American cultures at all in this podcast are two reasons. One, it is a civilization, civilizations even, groups of cultures and diverse cultures, um, mm -hmm. traditions that are many and varied that I have the deepest respect for. I have deep enough respect for these peoples to where I do not want to speak from, you know, first hand accounts and, you know, propagate some sort of a stereotype or some sort of um, misunderstanding or maybe just, just wrongly represent them. I have been making an absolutely ridiculous effort to try to contact someone, anyone at all, who can speak with any level of um, expertise and uh, trustability, trustworthiness, either from the point of view or from the academic research of any one of those traditions and cultures. I have been flat out stonewalled. Um, I've just today alone, I've called 14 different groups and um, I understand the very cautious um, approach to the strangers that a lot of native peoples have in, in, the, in the Americas. Um, but from, Inu from Inuit to various local Yuda tribes, I've tried even out of state tribes. I have not gotten one single person to speak to me. Um, I'm gonna to continue to try to reach out to someone. If somebody knows anyone who would be actually willing to talk, I just wanna give an accurate and respectful representation. And if anybody who is Native American or representative of is going to be ever listening to this podcast or, or Natives, you know, South Americas, North Americas, anybody who researches Native American culture and is actually willing to talk, I would be very grateful if you um, gave me some sort of a reference. It, I would, it would be much appreciated. That's about it, I think, for today. Anybody else? Yeah, I was going to ask, are we just going to go ahead? We've been doing it. It's about an hour uh, per podcast. That sounds good to everybody else. Sounds okay. good to me. All right, guys. Well, I think that's everything. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to try to do next week the same place and time. All right. Thank you. I love having you, everyone, on here, and it's awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Take care. Everybody be well. Bye-bye. Awesome. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. See you next week. See ya. that exist within every man's soul. Every man's and we soul. will live forever or as long as stories are told. Stories are told. Stories we are the are told. archetypes that exist within every man's soul.